Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman here at ASH 2023 for the CLL Society, where I'm the Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President. I'm Paul Hampel, I'm the Assistant Professor at Mayo Clinic, uh, where I am in the CLL group. Pleased to be here. Dr. Hampel, Venetoclax has changed the way we've treated CLL, and you're presenting some important research on Venetoclax clinical outcomes. Could you explain? what your research is about, why, it, why it's important, why it was chosen as something to be presented at ASH? Yeah, uh, certainly. As you said, Venetoclex has demonstrated incredible efficacy in phase three prospective studies in frontline setting, relapse setting. We have seen how well it can work in those clinical trials. We looked in our routine clinical practice, so patients not treated on a clinical trial who received Venetoclex in one of the three main scenarios that a patient might be getting this drug, either treatment naive, so their first treatment, relapsed, but uh, without any other prior novel agents, specifically a BTK inhibitor like ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib. So and in that case, would they have relapsed after chemo in most cases, chemoimmunotherapy or? Yeah, uh, that, it, it was some of both actually. And that I think is, you're getting uh. to a very important piece in the third group, which is uh, relapsed and BTKI exposed, so they had pre previously been treated uh, gotcha. with, with a BTK inhibitor. Within that group, there were patients who had received prior chemotherapy as well, or patients who were chemotherapy naive, never seen it. Uh, and I think that's a group that there's really no data on and is uh, becoming increasingly of interest as uh, these drugs have replaced chemoimmunotherapy more or less in, in all lines. So this is real world data looking retrospectively at your, re your, your population of patients you've treated. Correct, yeah, we always, you know, how real world it is at, uh, since we're at a big tertiary center always, right. you know, requires some caveats to apply to, the, to right. the general population, but correct, all of these patients were treated off of a clinical trial. Right, so when I say real world, they were treated um, on, by a prescription from a doctor, not in a clinical yeah. trial. Important because those patient populations don't always look the same with eligibility criteria to get into studies and the rigor of following them and, and so forth. Right, right, and all the testing and everything that's different. So what did you find? Yeah, so for the first two groups there, the, the treatment naive or first line uh, treated group and the relapsed BTKI naive, so prior chemotherapy but no prior ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib or BTK inhibitor. Those data pretty much looked like what we saw in the clinical trials, uh, which was reassuring to see. And so the, um, the, the outcomes are very good and it's, it's nice to see that, particularly in the, in the first line setting where there's quite minimal data um, in, in off trial treated patients. So um, matching that up to CLL14 clinical trial very similar outcomes in, in uh, we looked at something called time to next treatment or death. This is a, a surrogate, so to speak, for progression-free survival. Um, so the time until the patient needs the next line of therapy or, right. or death, uh, as well as overall survival, just due to the retrospective nature of, of this work, uh, that's a more you know, accurate, and it's, it's, it's something that patients care about more so than seeing perhaps uh, their, their disease come back slightly. It's because when it am can, I gonna need to do something about this again? Yeah, because you can progress and not need therapy. You got it. And that's so, not something would be followed so much in the clinic, it would be followed more in a trial and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. So, so for the, the first line treated patients, uh, they did very well. Uh, the outcomes looked very similar to uh, an on-trial patient population from CLL 14. Likewise, uh, the, the subgroup that looked like the Murano uh, trial-treated patients, which is venetoclax plus rituximab in a, uh, in a basically no patients on that study had, had received prior BTK and had a very small number, uh, they did very similar as well. Uh, and then the largest group in our study was 83 patients who were BTKI exposed, prior treatment with a BTK inhibitor. Uh, and that was really a tale of two, two stories within that group, whether or not the disease had progressed on that BTK inhibitor or whether or not uh, they had stopped it for a toxicity. So 
tell me those two stories. Yeah, okay. So the, essentially the patients who, who had prior disease progression on a BTK inhibitor had a fairly underwhelming uh, duration of, of remission, a time until their next, needed the next therapy or death when treated with a venetoclex-based regimen. And there was some heterogeneity there. There was patients who got venetoclex monotherapy or venetoclex plus rituximab or venetoclex plus obinutuzumab. Um, about a third were in the venetoclex monotherapy group. Um, all in all, those outcomes looked, we didn't formally statistically analyze it given the numbers, but they, they looked fairly similar. There was a signal as uh, we've kind of come to expect that the obinutuzumab containing group might do a bit better than, than with rituximab or, or on its own. But uh, all across the board, it comes out to just under two years of time before needing another, another treatment. This is actually quite similar to the data that Jeff Jones had presented now five plus years ago in the only prospective data we have from a clinical trial of patients receiving venetoclex after um, a prior BTK inhibitor, and that had a, a median progression-free survival of about two years, or a little bit under in the patients who had actually had their disease progress. The good news was for the patients who had stopped their BTK inhibitor in the setting of prior toxicity did much better um, and, and had a much longer uh, time until needing additional therapy. But I think we all are, you know, we're, we're happy to have these classes of drugs and, and we feel like we've always got the next thing in our back pocket with them. Um, but we also often think of the data from Murano or from other studies where there was no novel agent exposed patients in it and we kind of, us and the patients, will, exp will kind of take for granted we're going to get some sort of benefit of that duration and in reality in this pr particular, you know, setting it might be shorter than, than we had thought in a non-novel agent uh, group. That's kind of a knock on the head, isn't it? I mean, that's, uh, it's, I, uh, somewhat disappointing, obviously, as a patient because people have always talked about the sequencing and the, 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 the BTKs, and especially for the high-risk disease, that, you know, try those first. Did, did you look at that in your numbers? Were you able to see if it made a difference, whether this was a high-risk patient with had TP53 um, mutation or 17P deletion or unmutated versus mutated IGHV? Any, any subgroup analysis like that? We, we looked for predictive markers uh, or prognostic markers there. Uh, actually, the only thing that came out as significant, both in the, the time to next therapy or death model and the overall survival model was complex karyotype, which we defined as three or more structural abnormalities um, in, in this study. The cohort as a whole, uh, having a large portion of relapsed patients were enriched for TP53 disruption and unmutated yeah. IGHV compared to right. to folks starting out, and to not you know be so uh, to leave it on on a pessimistic note here would be that there was a small group within that group then um, that was actually chemotherapy naive. Uh, so that's I think becoming now looking towards the future what will be the scenario that we're really most interested in knowing if you got first-line BTK inhibitor or you got first-line venetoclex, you know, how did the subsequent one work in patients who had received no prior chemo or chemoimmunotherapy whatsoever? The numbers were too small to really hang the hat on, but uh, the, the group that was chemotherapy naive had prior BTKI only and uh, stopped due to toxicity had a very long um, progression-free survival, so to speak, the TTNTD. Unfortunately, actually, the, it, was, it was better than patients who were more heavily pretreated, but it, wasn't, they, it was not terribly long uh, for patients who had, only who had not received any prior chemotherapy, had received um, a BTK inhibitor, and had disease progression on the BTK inhibitor, and then got venetoclex. It was still, you know, around three years in our study, which I think, for me, that was still a sobering number and, and a bit underwhelming to what we would have imagined. Wow, I mean, that's really eye-opening. Uh, any final thoughts or anything, any message you want to give to patients about this research? I think that the, this stresses that as much as the field has moved forward and these have had a dramatic impact in, in the lives of, of patients and given us the tools to, to take better care, our work is not done. 
and we need to continue to, uh, to keep striving to improve on, on current therapies and, and the current approaches. I would echo that. You know, CLL is not a solved problem, and as great as the drugs we have, there's still significant issues. Uh, I am so grateful for the work you and your colleagues at Mayo are doing. Uh, thank you so much. My privilege. Thank you.